Welcome back. I know you can't wait to get started, so let's get to it. Here we are in Jamovi, and just as before, we're gonna start by loading a data set. So clicking on this button right here, and then finding exercise data, if you have recently opened that, which all of you should. And that will open our data set. And as before, we need to click on weight.loss and go to data and then setup and then change that to a continuous variable because by default, uh, by the way, what I learned from the Jamovi developers is by default, anything with 20 levels or less is going to default to treating it as a nominal variable. And there's actually a good reason for that, which kind of sucks because it gives us some complication. Long story short, for most of the analyses that Jamovi does, it actually doesn't matter what they call it, but for my module, the Glenn Mod and FlexPlot modules, it actually does matter, unfortunate. So we're just gonna have to tolerate this for a little bit. And with that being said, make sure to look in the description for an updated Jamovi module that is constantly updated. So make sure you get the most up-to-date Jamovi module that I've created. All right, back to the data. So we're gonna click on analyses and then we're gonna go to Glenn Mod and then click on general linear model. And then just as before, we're gonna input the weight loss as the outcome variable. And for this first analysis, I'm gonna go ahead and look at therapy.type. So again, this is two different therapies, either a behaviorist driven therapy or a cognitive driven therapy. And just as before, we can look at the diagnostic plots. So here we have the residuals and they appear to be about normally distributed, nothing too concerning. We have a few outliers on this side, but nothing to worry about. The SL plot, remember this tells us how much heteroskedasticity we have. And we are looking for flat lines and we have a flat line. So, hey, we doing good. And then here is the analysis graphic. So we've got the behaviorist condition with the median and the uh, 75th percentile here, the 25th percentile here. And we have the cognitive group with, with a little bit of skewness and that's all right. So we've got 75th percentile here, the median here, and the 25th percentile here. But overall, it looks like the behaviorist group is doing a little bit better than the cognitive group. But let's go ahead, but let's go ahead and look at some estimates. So the first estimates is going to give you is what it's, it's labeled estimates and effect sizes. And so it'll tell you what variable it's looking at and what level. So therapy type has two levels. There's behaviorist and cognitive, and this will give you the means. The 7.66 is the mean weight loss in the behaviorist group. So on average, those in the behaviorist group lost about seven and a half pounds. While in the cognitive therapy group, they lost three and a half pounds. So clearly the behaviorists are doing a little bit better. The lower and upper, uh, we will talk about that when we get into probability, but they are basically the ranges that we would expect. Uh, well, that's, that's really our estimate of how um, precise our mean is. So we say it's probably 7.66, but it may be anywhere from 6.63 to 8.69. And then don't worry about the rest of these values down here. Now we get down to what we really are interested in. We don't necessarily care about the means of the behaviorist group or the cognitive group. What we really want to know is what is the mean difference between the two. And that's what this panel gives you is it tells you what variable it's looking at in the comparison. Now, uh, eventually we're gonna be talking about situations where we have three grouping variables. So you might have behaviorist, cognitive, and a control. And in those situations, you're going to have, you know, behaviorist versus control, behaviorist or cognitive versus control and behaviorist versus cognitive. So that specific part in Jamovi will actually have three rows. But for now, because we only have one comparison to make, it's only going to have one row. And so what this tells you is that the difference between cognitive and behaviorist is negative 4.15 pounds or, and that's why that says minus. So when you take the cognitive mean and then subtract from it the behaviorist mean, you get a negative value, which makes sense because the cognitive group are lower. And so there is a difference of 4.15 pounds. And these are our lower and upper limits. Again, we'll talk more about what that means once we get into probability. And then that is our Cohen's D. And remember our Cohen's D, the benchmarks are around 0.2-ish, is considered a small effect, 
0.5 ish plus or minus is considered a medium effect and 0.8 is considered a large effect so basically we have a large effect so it seems like the difference between cognitive and behavior is pretty big and then here um, we usually don't talk about r squared um, and semi-partial r squared we'll talk about what that means when we get into the multivariate estimates um, but basically this is the square of the correlation coefficient so if you take the square root of that that will give you the correlation coefficient so that's the relationship between therapy type and uh, weight loss. That's the word. Um, and now let's go ahead and look at a bivariate numeric on numeric relationship. So for this, we're gonna go ahead and move out the therapy type and then we're gonna look at motivation. So how does motivation uh, affect people's weight loss? And we first have our diagnostic plots so that right there is our histogram, and it says that the residuals are approximately normally distributed. Um, I know some people, when they're new to this, they start saying, hey, that's bimodal, there's two modes there. And what we're really looking for for bimodal stuff is if there's like a lot of separation between the modes. So since those two quote unquote modes are pretty close to each other, we're not worried about this. But this looks approximately symmetrical, so I'm not too concerned about this. And then over here we have the residual dependence plots. And again, we are looking for a relatively straight line. And this shows a lowest line that is allowed to bend with it to help you to direct your attention to possible non-linearities that may be present. And there's some bendiness in here, but what I'm noticing is it is always at the extremes where there's less data. So um, that could be something that we might want to worry about um, and check into, but for our purposes, I'm going to say that that's close enough. I'm not too concerned about that. And then here we have the SL plot. Again, what we're looking for is um, a relatively flat line indicating that we have homoscedasticity, or like I've said before, the y-axis can be roughly interpreted as your degree of uncertainty and this tells you that across the fitted values or across the values of our predictor variable, which is motivation, we are relatively flat. So we're equally certain across all ranges of our uh, variable on motivation, which is good. And then now we have the analysis plot, which shows the relationship between motivation and weight loss. And like I said before, and as we saw in the uh, residual dependence plot, there's some bendiness to the line, but I actually feel pretty comfortable by just calling that a regression line, but I'm gonna go ahead and change it from a lowest line to a regression line. And that is the visual representation of the estimates that we're gonna look at here shortly, or right now, really. So now we got estimates and effect sizes for categorical predictors. And uh, right here, this first column tells you what the estimates are for the numeric variables and by the way, in the future, uh, we're gonna look at multivariate relationships, so we might have numeric and categorical variables in the same analysis, in which case you will see kind of two separate sections of rows. But here we only have one section. This is the numeric variables, and if, like I said, if you had the uh, categorical variables that below this motivation right here, it would say categorical variables or whatever. So this tells you the intercept right here is negative 3.741 and motivation is the slope or the slope that corresponds to the motivation variable. So let's go ahead and spend some time interpreting this. So negative 3.74. So that tells you that if your motivation, your predictor variable is zero, we expect your weight loss to be at negative 3.74 pounds. Or in other words, if you have, if you score zero on the motivation measure, we expect you to actually gain 3.74 pounds. And that actually makes sense. If you're not motivated to exercise, you're probably not gonna be losing weight and you might actually gain weight. And then we've got motivation down here and it says for every increase in motivation, what we expect is your weight loss to increase by 0.175 points, okay? 
So if you gain a 10 point increase, for example, you would lose uh, 1.75 extra pounds. And that just happens when you multiply that by 10. Um, now here, the standardized estimates do actually make sense. So this puts um, the estimate in uh, standard deviation units. So this tells you that as you increase in your motivation by a standard deviation, then you increase in weight loss by a third of a standard deviation. And previously I mentioned the benchmarks for Cohen's D and you can kind of sort of think about that as the same thing here. So a Cohen's D of 0.2 means a small effect, 0.5 means a larger effect. Now they're not exactly equivalent and these rules are going to kind of get messed up sometimes. But for now let's go ahead and say that a difference of 0.34 is a moderately strong effect, not massive, not tiny, so somewhere in the middle. And in a future update, this will not show up. This should only show up if you have categorical predictors, which we don't in this case. And then finally, we got the R squared and the semi-partial R squared. And so that tells you the R squared of the model is 0.113. And if we want to look at the correlation coefficient, I'm just going to type it in my Mac here. So square root of 0.113. Okay, so it says the correlation coefficient is 0.34. Um, now, in a future update, which I will do today, this afternoon, I'm gonna update that so it gives you not only the R squared, but also the correlation coefficient. Like I said, in a future update, I'm gonna change that so it actually reports that so you don't have to do the square root of it. And I'm actually forgetting off the top of my head what the benchmarks are for a correlation coefficient. I wanna say, 0.2 is considered small, 0.5 is considered large, and then point something in the middle is considered medium. So we're looking at about a medium effect size, so wahoo. That is a very brief introduction and in how you do estimates in Jamovi. So I encourage you to find your own data sets to play with and do some practice, or you could even use the exercise data sets and look at other variables and see what kind of estimates come from those. Until next time.